All right, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you today um, the work I've been doing over the last number of years, really looking at the role of the default network in cognition in the human brain. So this work really started um, a number of years ago in terms of how I was thinking about um, the nature of cognition and some of the first exposures to work as an undergraduate, um, in particular, a paper by Endel Tolvin titled Memory and Consciousness. And in this, Dr. Tolvin was speaking with the amnesic KC, who had very dense retrograde amnesia and was unable to recollect any single event from his past. What's quite interesting is that this amnesic also had this co-occurring deficit in that he was unable to think about the future. So let me just show you what that looks like. So Dr. Tolvin, when interviewing KC, would ask, so let's try the question again about the future. What will you be doing tomorrow? And to this, KC would pause for about 15 seconds, and smile faintly and says, I don't know. Dr. Tolvin, do you remember the question about what I'll be doing tomorrow? Dr. Tolvin, yes. How would you describe your state of mind when you try to think about it? Followed by a five second pause and he'd say blank, I guess. Now, in other characterizations, Casey described that the feeling of being asked to think about the future was like being brought into the room and told to sit down in a chair and there's no chair. Now, this really struck me at the time um, and when I really grappled to understand how is it that by virtue of losing the ability to recollect the past, there would be this co-occurring deficit in this inability to think about the future and what sort of neural mechanism was potentially underlying this ability to mentally travel through time. And this was really the start of my explorations of understanding the default network of the brain. Um, so today, I'll, what I'll be covering are a number of different studies conducted over the years. First, really looking at the role of the default network in active cognitive states, so the role of the default network in cognition. And then moving into how the default network is involved in goal-oriented behavior. So the third part, I'll discuss a series of studies examining how the default network interacts with broader executive control functions to support, again, goal-oriented behavior, before finally taking on a more lifespan perspective, examining the nature of default executive interactions with advancing age. Prior observations of neuropsychological studies of lesions. Um, so this is truly a unique and novel discovery of human neuroscience is the discovery of the default network. Um, what's quite remarkable is that it's also one of the most reliable and robust findings across all of cognitive neuroscience. And what you see depicted here is one of you know, the most basic kinds of tasks which, where you can identify the default network. And here is just a standard block design where we have, um, now this could be an even or odd number judgment task, um, it doesn't really matter. What we have is uh, periods of fixation that are interleaved with an active cognitive task that require visuospatial attention to this external stimuli. And what you see during this task is that there's a systematic suppression of these regions in medial parietal, medial prefrontal cortex and other structures. However, we see this across a wide range of tasks. And while the first observation started with PET imaging in St. Louis, um, looking at visuospatial processing, perception, language tasks, uh, across all of these studies, um, and some of these first ones were really integrated by Schulman in 1989 um, in the paper in Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, what you see is this systematic suppression of regions in which have now come to be characterized as the default network. Now, this network seems to actually have this complex relationship with other structures of the brain, um, in particular, the dorsal attention network, which demonstrates the di this dynamic anti-correlation. And we see this in numerous contexts in human imaging. On the one hand, in task, where we see suppression of the default network during um, visuospatial tasks and engagement of the dorsal attention network, including superior parietal lobule, MT, frontal eye fields, and other structures. However, we can also observe this competitive relationship using resting state um, and in resting state functional connectivity, where we see patterns of rising bold signal in some regions and then decreasing in others, such that these core regions of the default network depicted here in green blue, um, with these all tend to increase together and while regions in gold are moving down. So this is where we 
characterized these two networks of having this anti-correlated relationship. Yet there's this strong functional coherence within the system of the default network. And once again, just to review the regions we see here in green, we have uh, posterior cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex, the medial temporal lobes, lateral temporal lobes, and inferior parietal lobule. All of these core structures that make up the default network of the brain. Now, by and large, what we see is that the pattern of activity associated with the default network is really mostly captured by uh, intervals of fixation or these are regions that are suppressed during an active cognitive task that again requires visuospatial attention. And so largely this network was characterized by virtue of its suppression um, or it passive conditions, which is not extremely helpful in terms of trying to understand the cognitive processes that underlie this system. When I was a graduate student, Randy Buckner published this paper in Trends in Cognitive Sciences, uh, which began, I think, to really nicely elucidate what and integrate some findings that are scattered across the literature that pointed to what some of these functions of the default network might be. And they were broadly characterized as self-projection. So the idea was that those tasks that suppress default network activity are very much stimulus bound and involve the processing of information in the immediate environment. But what Randy Buckner hypothesized was that the functions of the default network actually all seem to involve this release from the immediate stimulus environment and involve this self-projection in time and into the minds of others and into different environments. And he observed that there were a number of tasks that were scattered across the literature, some of which weren't actually even speaking to each other very much, that seemed to be engaging some of these core regions of the default network. So let me just give an, a sense of what these tasks are, what we have depicted in the center of the screen is an individual at a picnic um, with another woman. And what this individual can do is mentally travel back in time and remember that experience of the picnic. He can bring to mind the rich spatiotemporal environment of that experience. At the same time, he can also mentally travel forward in time and imagine that experience of cleaning up the picnic grounds uh, with this woman. Similarly, and I think which was a, quite a novel insight is this individual can also mentally project themselves into the mind of this in other individual and can imagine how annoyed they're going to be to be asked to help clean up the picnic grounds when she wasn't even there to enjoy the picnic herself. So he can leave the immediate perceptual environment and decode um, and infer her thoughts and feelings even though they're not perceptually present. And using a similar process, uh, they hypothesize that this self-projection also extends to navigation, in particular allocentric navigation, where you can travel up in your mind's eye and imagine and see and recollect the environment that's around you. In a similar way, you can imagine the space that you're in, and if you were to walk out the door down the hall and into another room, you can see that image in your mind's eye. And all of these processes share this common feature in that there's this projection from the self out of the immediate here and now. And by virtue of the default network's role in stimulus independent thought, Randy Buckner hypothesized that these four cognitive processes are all supported by the default network of the brain. Now, I was extremely excited when I first received this paper and read the paper. Um, really because I was so interested in this, this link between the past and the future and this potential common mechanism uh, for mentally traveling in time. And a really good friend of mine, Raymond Marr, was involved in some studies looking at social cognition. And even though we had spoken a lot, um, we played poker on a regular basis and we talked research, we never actually thought that our research interests converged. Um, so once this paper came out, all of a sudden there was this dramatic sort of reconfiguration, at least in my own mind, about what kinds of cognition could be supported by the default network. And together with Raymond Marr and Alice Kim, who is an incoming graduate student to work with Mendel Tolving, we decided to, as graduate students, to just systematically examine the literature and to see if there was empirical support for this hypothesis put forward by Randy Buckner. So what we did is we conducted a systematic review of the literature in each of the respective domains of autobiographical memory, 
introspection or imagining the future, navigation, theory of mind, and the default mode. And we conducted five independent, sorry, four independent um, meta-analyses in addition to prospection where there was a couple of new studies coming out. And we saw the independent pattern, independent yet reliable patterns of activity for each of these cognitive states, and then overlaid these maps across the brain. And in fact, we did see uh, a, a substantial amount of conjunction across these uh, previously examined as independent task domains. And again, the core areas where we see overlap uh, between autobiographical memory and theory of mind and the default network and navigation is here in posterior cingulate cortex, medial prefrontal cortex, the medial temporal lobe, lateral temporal lobe, inferior parietal lobule, as well as the inferior frontal gyrus. So these emerging regions of the default network. So this really started to lend empirical support to this hypothesis that the default network um, is supporting these multiple aspects of cognition. So this is a very exciting idea, and I felt like an important thing moving forward was to really examine um, whether or not the same brain performing multiple tasks would actually show this kind of pattern of conjunction. Because what we see here are reliable, is reliable activity across the literature where individuals are performing only one of these tasks. So really the key test was, would be to look within individual performing these multiple tasks if indeed we see a conjunction across uh, these processes. So we did this by designing a task, and I did this with Cheryl Grady in my first postdoctoral fellowship at the Rotman Research Institute in Toronto. And we developed this task paradigm um, wherein individuals would see a photograph with a, a keyword presented with it, uh, a social photograph where there's always individuals present. And after a four second viewing condition, um, they would move forward and be asked to remember an event related to the photograph, imagine a future event related to the photo, or to imagine the thoughts and feelings of a target individual within this photograph. And after 10 seconds, uh, they rated how, how clearly they were able to bring this to mind. And finally, we had a, a fourth condition, which was more of a baseline control, where they saw a scrambled image um, and made a button press response. So when we analyzed these data, uh, and here we used partial D squares, which is a multivariate approach, um, the results are often quite similar to what you see with the GLM. However, you'll notice that I'll, I'll talk about the data a little bit differently, but this is in the same family of analyses as independent components analysis or principal components analysis. So when we analyze these data, what we see is that there, is, um, there are two significant components in the data. The first one, maximally dissociated, are three conditions of interest, autobiographical memory, prospection, and theory of mind, from the somatosensory control condition. So we see the autobiographical memory, or remembering the past, imagining the future, and thinking about the thoughts and feelings of others, engages these regions here in gold, which again, we see are these core structures of the default network in posterior cingulate, um, some aspects of medial prefrontal cortex, the lateral temporal lobes, inferior parietal lobule, as well as this inferior frontal gyrus. So this suggested that within subjects, there's this covariant of brain activity and response that's common across all three of these experimental conditions. However, there is also a second significant component in the data, and this one maximally dissociated theory of mind reasoning, depicted in gold, from autobiographical memory and prospection, shown here in blue. So what we see is that theory of mind also had more specific and selective engagement of the posterior superior temporal sulcus bilaterally, as well as the right temporal parietal junction. Whereas autobiographical memory and prospection really robustly engage these midline structures and ventromedial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate extending down into retrospinal cortex and the hippocampus bilaterally. So again, what these data suggested is that it's true, there is this common set of regions that are engaged within the default network across these three tasks, be they a theory of mind or mentalizing and mnemonic processes like autobiographical remembering and prospection. However, there are specific regions that are more specialized for the differential aspects of these task conditions. Now, oh, there's actually a pretty nice replication study that was published in Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. Um, in fact, it came out in the same issue and then more recently, uh, we, we replicated these findings again 
um, in a study and uh, have released the data. So if you're interested in working with multi-echo task data or resting state, um, this is now publicly available as well. So this really suggests that these findings are, are quite robust. There are some very interesting newer findings coming out of Randy Buckner's lab suggesting that some of these, uh, the common patterns um, may still be yet distinct. And this is an ongoing area of debate in terms of the functional dissociation of even some of these common regions. Um, and so that's certainly warranted a further exploration. However, at the same time, um, as this work was being done, Jessica Andrews Hanna, um, in collaboration with Randy Buckner, were also looking at the functions and organization of the default network. And here they identified um, what seemed to be two distinct subsystems, um, very similar to the observations of that second component that I showed you for the, our task data, in that this one subsystem involving the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex um, also included the anterior temporal lobe, lateral temporal cortex, and the TPJ. And that these regions were functionally dissociated both in resting state connectivity and a series of introspective tasks involving memory and um, social thinking. In contrast, there was a dissociable medial temporal lobe subsystem that included retrospinal cortex, hippocampus, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, as well as um, the more caudal extent of the, in, of the posterior inferior parietal lobule. And there are these core hub regions that occupied in posterior cingulate and medial prefrontal cortex that seem to integrate the information across these two subsystems. So it, it seemed like these findings nice, nicely dovetailed with, with these other observations, suggesting that there are core common areas and, and distinct yet interacting subsystems. Now I've since uh, worked with Jessica Andrews Hanna um, in a review paper from a number of years ago. And what was quite interesting is that we were able to um, really integrate some of these findings together in, within this newly understood framework um, devised from resting state connectivity where Thomas Yeo showed again that we have these potentially core regions of the default network and these functionally distinct and dissociable um, subregions that include again the medial temporal lobe subsystem and was referred to as this dorsal medial subsystem that includes more lateral temporal lobes, the TPJ, et cetera. And so in using these regions initially identified with resting state connectivity, we then conducted another meta-analysis, uh, this time using NeuroSynth. Um, and this is in a way kind of a big dumb meta-analysis, but because of its method, we were able to extract keywords from each of these regions of interest across thousands and thousands of studies and to examine what, the, what these cognitive terms were then associated with activity in these regions. And again, we see this nice dissociation between the subsystems. So on the one hand, we have the dorsal medial subsystem that includes a number of different social terms, um, including person, social, mentalizing, mental scenarios, and theory of mind. But interestingly, also some semantic terms, such as comprehension, sentence, and language, which I believe is consistent with this idea of, the, of Broca's area and some semantic knowledge processing regions in lateral temporal lobe. However, we also extracted, again, this medial temporal lobe subsystem terms. And here we see much more specifically mnemonic terms related to autobiographical, remember, recollection, memories, and so on. And then finally, we have this core region, the core regions that include the, these midline structures of posterior cingulate, medial prefrontal cortex, as well as part of the inferior parietal lobule. And these showed key terms across, again, thousands of studies, uh, more related to self, self-referential, personal, and person. So again, this puts in this framework where it seemed as though in this process of stimulus-independent thought or self-generated thought, um, that there are core regions of the default network that are engaged in these distinct interacting subsystems that are specialized for various kinds of information processing. On the one hand, more the social, and on the other, more the mnemonic. And there's ongoing work in my laboratory to really understand some of the dynamics in terms of how does this default network interact with itself in, in the flow of information within this system and how does it incorporate information from other regions of the brain, um, importantly, I think from perception and then leading to the outgoing connections from the system that will be key for action. And really like how is the default network situated within this broader context of the brain. Um, 
So on the one hand, um, I have this great ongoing interest in understanding the core functions of the network, but also I think it's important to understand how does it influence and bias cognition as we navigate the world. So it seems we have this specialized system for social and conceptual knowledge about our world and ourself. And this, I think, is one of the core functions of the default network. What's important to understand is how does this influence cognition? How does this influence behavior? So in our initial studies in cognitive neuroscience, um, you know, we've really looked at the default network in terms of its suppression. But I think we need to, in addition to understanding its role in stimulus-independent thought, how is it these thoughts inform our action and guide our behavior? So I just want to give an example for how this happens every day um, in our everyday world in terms of navigating um, the environment. So um, what you see here on the screen is um, a picture of a human face. You know a lot about this face. Um, I'm sure you retrieve their name spontaneously and quite immediately. You might even have some thoughts and feelings associated uh, with this person. And all of these, these thoughts, the, the name and this information like spontaneously comes to mind when you see this image. And this is extremely adaptive. So if you remember a time when you could actually walk around in the world and socialize with people, uh, maybe you're, you're walking through the hallway on campus and you see someone down the hall and you, it's very adaptive to remember what their name is when, when you're talking to them. So there's that spontaneous retrieval. You might have an effective response. You might want to remember what the last time you saw them to catch up, to pick up a conversation where it left off. Or maybe there was important and significant salience to that conversation that warrants returning to or at least acknowledging. All of this prior information can come to mind and serve to guide that social interaction that, that facilitates um, those dynamics. And in the absence of that spontaneous retrieval of information, that would lead to a fairly impoverished social dynamic um, and could be quite maladaptive, in fact. So it seems as though the functions of the default network, the spontaneous retrieval of information that's not immediately apparent in the perceptual environment is quite key in terms of facilitating uh, the, social, the navigation of the social world, which I think all of us are missing uh, to a fair extent right now. But one of the things we're asking is, how do we start to derive tasks that allow us to have empirical control over these sort of spontaneous processes? And that's really been a big challenge of mine because um, the default network is, it's a really tricky set of regions to investigate and is not very well amenable to most cognitive neuroscience type tasks when you're looking for their active engagement. Um, it's far easier to suppress this system with information um, that's not rich in personal meaning. So, but we know that when we navigate the world, we rely upon these things. So a question was, how is it we can leverage default network processes in a way that we can support goal-directed cognition in an experimental context? And in order to do this, uh, we, we turn to more well-established uh, cognitive neuroscience tasks. Uh, for example, here are the NBAC task. So in this paradigm, what participants do is they'll see a stream of stimuli, be they numbers or letters or shapes with, with various colors, um, each one viewed for approximately 500 milliseconds with a delay. And the job of the participant is to determine whether the stimulus they're seeing currently is the same as they saw n ago. Um, so be it a, a one or two or, or three images previously. So this is a rather taxing working memory with updating task. And when we image this kind of task, um, here this is a, a meta-analysis of the NVAC, we see pretty robust engagement of the dorsal attention network and other areas involved in executive control, including lateral prefrontal cortex. However, what we, our objective in this task was to embed within the NBAC framework information that had some personal salience to it. And to do this, we developed this faces NBAC task. And within it, some of these faces were famous. So there was prior knowledge um, would be called upon, um, in most cases, probably spontaneously, given the rapid nature of the task. So here, similar to the standard NBAC, we see 
this stream of stimuli, 500 milliseconds each with a two second delay. And participants uh, perform this two back where they matched an anonymous face with an anonymous face interleaved. They matched an anonymous face with a famous face interleaved, or they matched a famous face with someone anonymous interleaved. So these were actually our three conditions of interest. Um, so all anonymous faces, an anonymous face match, or a famous face match. And we had two predictions in this task. One, that there would be a facilitation of task performance when matching on fame. So we think that people would perform better um, when the match was a famous face match and that they could draw upon that prior knowledge to facilitate task performance. And second, we predicted that there would be greater engagement of the default network during performance on matching on fame. Now these predictions were actually um, the reverse of what most predictions would be in cognitive neuroscience. Engagement of the default network in a standard NBAC task, for example, would be was often indicative of action slips and predictive of errors. And we think that's because the nature of the stimuli itself. So here we're trying to align performance with what is attractive to the default network. So these processes are engaging personal social knowledge. So first off, what we observed was that uh, our participants were significantly more accurate when matching on fame, and they also had a faster reaction time. So across, um, across task conditions. So we see, so when they're matching on fame, the, in fact, performance is better, both in terms of accuracy and reaction time. So next we turn to the brain data. So first, this is um, a block design task embedded within the blocks. We see these stream of faces relative to the fixation intervals, we see pretty robust engagement of this extended working memory system, um, including lateral prefrontal cortex. And another finding that I think is quite nice, um, on the ventral temporal lobe, we see that there's significant engagement of the putative fusiform face area. So this is a nice convergence and replication of working regions involved in working memory, including um, activation of face regions. So this is a nice characterization of the basic task itself. However, next we were looking at the individual trial specifically. Um, and in this case, this contrast shows us when participants observe the first instance of a famous face depicted in gold versus the first instance of an anonymous face, um, randomly selected to be matched for a number of trials. And what we see when our participants, um, they're seeing the famous face for the first time, there is this transient increase in activity in these core regions of the default network, again, including posterior cingulate retrospinal cortex, down into hippocampus, medial prefrontal cortex, aspects of lateral, temporal lobes. Um, so all regions of the default network, in addition to some structures that are outside of it, um, which are, I think are quite interesting, including the anterior insula, and also more anterior uh, parts of the ventral temporal lobe. Also what we see when participants um, first engage with this anonymous face, is that there's substantially more recruitment of these areas involved in executive control. So we see this extensive rostral prefrontal, middle frontal gyrus, the anterior extent of the inferior prior lobule, all these regions involved in the, um, the maintenance of in an executive control of information. So to say another way, when we see that famous face for the first time, there's actually this attenuation of activity in executive control regions and this recruitment of regions of the default network. And then finally, when we look at the, the activation that's involved over the course of the entire triplet, so this is from the initial instance of the famous face through to the, the next trial and then to the famous face match versus an anonymous face match, what we see is that, again, there is this um, transient yet sustained activity of the core regions of the default network during the famous face match. And we see this in the hippocampus, uh, retrospinal cortex into posterior cingulate, ventral medial prefrontal cortex and lateral temporal lobe. So again, what this suggests is that when we align the task goals with the functions of the default network, we see this improved performance and we see transient engagement of the default network associated with better task performance. Uh, very much consistent with our predictions and this emerging view of the core functions of the default network. This is where it seems that when we can align those task goals to draw upon that information, we see improved performance. And on the one hand, this shouldn't be terribly surprising and 
we see some of our predictions come from the cognitive literature where when individuals are working with prior knowledge, there's an improvement of performance um, in memory and executive control tasks. But it seems that the default network is a core set of regions that, that support that process. All right, so moving forward um, to the third part of this talk, I'm gonna be discussing a number of studies that I conducted really trying to unpack some of the nature of the interactions of the default network with executive control functions. So on the one hand, on the previous study, we saw an attenuation and a shifting in the pattern of activity. Um, however, I'm very interested in the nature of how the default network can constructively interact with aspects of executive control. And to do this, um, we conducted a series of studies associated um, with, um, under the broad rubric of autobiographical planning. Sorry, I'm having an alert come up on my computer. Hopefully someone will let me know if there's a question or something urgent. Okay, uh-oh, there we go. Okay, um, so this process of autobiographical planning, and I'm kind of jumping to the end before I walk you through it, is a process wherein we formulate um, we recognize goals for our own life and formulate personal plans by which to accomplish those goals. And this process is mnemonic in nature in that it is drawing upon memory and a reconstructive element of memory, as well as requiring executive control processes to integrate information over time. And in doing so, what we see is robust recruitment of hippocampus, these medial structures of the default network, as well as rostral prefrontal cortex, and other aspects of executive control regions. So let me just show you what, what this is involved, what is underlying this autobiographical planning process. Well, prior to this work, planning had been fairly extensively studied, um, starting in the neuropsychological literature um, with Tim Chalice's introduction to the Tower of London planning task, um, and then into neuroimaging. Now, the Tower of London planning task is kind of a radical reductionist view of planning. In this process, um, there's this uh, stimulus apparatus that includes um, these disks on these various rods um, and the presentation of a goal configuration and then the start configuration. And uh, the process of planning involves determining in the minimum number of steps, the optimal process by which to, to move these disks one at a time with nothing on top in order to match um, the goal configuration. So, in this case, the green disc would be moved forward one, the red disc two, the blue would go on top of the green and the red disc back to match the goal configuration. So this is a four move planning task, uh, which is moderately difficult. And um, as I mentioned, this is a very radical reductionist view of planning, but it embodies some of its core elements and that there's a need to recognize the current position and the disparity between the current position and the start position and sequencing the information um, over time to accomplish that goal, as well as potentially inhibiting obstacles, such as making counterintuitive moves. And this process of planning tends to robustly engage the regions depicted here in gold uh, associated with the dorsal attention network. Now this was, um, this is quite interesting and it's consistent with the working memory literature. And however, what I was quite struck by was the fact that the way we interact with our personal future involves not just imagining a place and time somewhere in the future where you could sit and have a coffee with a friend of yours, but also making those active constructive plans by which to accomplish that goal. And we know that these systems are anti-correlated with each other. So really the question was like, how is that we're able to formulate these autobiographical plans that leverage that uh, working memory constructive aspect of executive function with this mnemonic process of autobiographically relevant information. And to do this, we devised this new task, this autobiographical planning task, that were to draw on real world areas of concern that involved a recognition of goals, as well as the steps to accomplish those goals and some obstacles that would need to be overcome. And we did this um, by sampling a number of undergraduates to determine a, a basic stimuli set that was reliable across individuals. And we designed it to parallel the Tower of London planning task procedure, at least to the extent that it was visually matched. So in this task, we present people with a goal. This is our number one goal for undergraduates in the Boston area, freedom from debt. 
Uh, and some steps to accomplish this goal would be to find a good job and save money. And an obstacle would be going out and having fun. Now, the goal, the, the participant's job here was to integrate these steps and obstacle into a single coherent plan in order to accomplish this goal. And we did this within, embedded within the stimulus framework. So the goal would be seen for five seconds. They'd have 15 seconds to formulate a plan. So in this case, um, if somebody decided to become an investment banker, they could set aside a certain percent of their income. And then with the residual, they could go out and have fun. So that would be an autobiographical plan to accomplish this goal. Um, we did an extensive series of interviews after the study to confirm that our participants were engaged in this autobiographical planning procedure. Obviously, having the goal of freedom from debt and coming up with a plan, this is something that one could think about for hours. Uh, you can talk to a financial planner about it. However, here in this 15 seconds, this is really just a snapshot of that process. And then following it, participants rated how much detail there was to their plan. Now, we also had our subjects perform the standard Tower of London task procedure and then a baseline counting condition where they counted the vowels in random letter sequences, again, within the apparatus. And counting has been a baseline control condition for both autobiographical memory and Tower of London. So it, it seemed like a, a good baseline condition here as well. So again, when we analyze these data with partial least squares, what we see are two significant components in the data. The first component maximally dissociated the two planning conditions such that visuospatial planning or Tower of London engaged the areas here in red, and autobiographical planning um, engaged these areas here in blue, and counting co-varied uh, with the visuospatial planning task. And what we see are the, is this topology that's pretty nicely consistent with the anti-correlated domains of uh, external visuospatial attention and internally oriented mnemonic processing. However, there's also a second significant component, and here both planning tasks uh, co-varied together and were dissociated from counting and engaged these areas here in green, including rostral prefrontal cortex, part of middle frontal gyrus, the anterior insula, dorsal anterior cingulate, and aspects of the dorsal um, extent of the inferior parietal lobule, sorry, the anterior extent of the inferior parietal lobules. So all of these regions are involved in the executive control of information flow in the brain. So what this suggested to us is that while there are these discrete domains, there is this um, domain general process of planning itself. And then through um, the process of sending this paper out for review, we reconceptualize the results in a couple of different frameworks um, because the multivariate approach isn't always clear to everyone. Um, here we used univariate uh, network ROIs that were independently identified from a resting state run and then extracted the bold signal. And what we see is, again, in the dorsal attention network, there's significant engagement of during visuospatial planning, and this network is suppressed during autobiographical planning. You see the reverse in the default network. Uh, autobiographical planning significantly engages this network, um, and visuospatial planning suppresses activity here. And then finally, both planning tasks are engaging the frontal parietal control network. Now we're interested in how these networks interact with each other um, in terms of large scale network coupling. And in one approach, we took these large scale ROIs and looked at the pattern of bold uh, correlation between the two large scale systems. So on the Y axis here, what we see is the magnitude of correlation with the frontal parietal control network. And during visuospatial planning or the Tower of London task performance, the dorsal attention network activity is significantly coupled with the frontal parietal control network. The default network is decoupled during visuospatial planning. Now, in contrast, during autobiographical planning, the dorsal attention network is decoupled from the frontal parietal control network. And the default network is significantly coupled with the frontal parietal control during autobiographical planning. So what we see here is a significant task by network interaction, where the active activity of the frontal parietal control network can flexibly couple with either the default or the dorsal attention network, depending upon the domain of the task. And I'm gonna be returning to this image in the context of aging in just a few minutes. But in the interim, i uh, just summarize by saying that the planning content seems to be domain specific, be it visuospatial or autobiographical, but the process of planning itself relies upon the cognitive control network. And that the default network coupled with the control network can support goal-oriented cognition. And this is again, a, a pretty um, significant observation 
given the origins of the discovery of this network were very much antithetical to goal-oriented behavior, predominantly with how we conceived of tasks and goal-oriented cognition within cognitive neuroscience. When you are aligning the task goals with the core functions of the default network, we can see how this network is both engaged and coupled with this executive control system. And it seems that like this interposed control network may integrate information both across attention or from the default network. In particular, this seems like there's this reconfiguration of memory when you see this coupling of default with executive control regions, and that's in concert with cognitive control operations. So finally, I'd like to um, finish off uh, by just talking about some of this work and its implications for aging. So we know as we get older, um, it's the process of cognitive aging is very much characterized by that of decline. And so what we see is that across a number of different neuropsychological measures, speed of processing, working memory, uh, episodic memory, we, we tend to get worse as we get older. So for each decade, cross-sectionally and longitudinally, um, cognitive aging is not great um, across a number of domains. However, there is a, a second, there's a different trajectory um, for a subset of tasks that are related to the accumulation of knowledge about the world or semantic knowledge. And this is typically measured by vocabulary. But what we see is that as we get older, we tend to accumulate knowledge and experience by virtue of just life experience. And there's this observation of lower frequency patterns um, and this gradual increase in knowledge that's really runs counter to the overall view of cognitive aging, which is characterized by decline. There are also systematic changes that occur to the brain. Um, on the one hand, there seems to be normal age-related changes to the structure of prefrontal cortex over time, um, as well as potentially more pathological changes, such as Alzheimer's disease, um, originating around the medial temporal lobe and radiating out through the default network. Um, so there seems to be these, these combined factors, not limited to this, that impact the aging brain and changes to cognition. When we look at brain function with fMRI, there's reliable changes occur in lateral prefrontal cortex, such that older adults tend to engage lateral prefrontal cortex to a greater degree than the young, um, whereas younger adults tend to engage more primary visual cortical processing. What we couldn't see with this meta-analysis, however, is that there are also systematic differences in how the default network is suppressed. So in this seminal study conducted by Cindy Lustig, what we see in the young during performance on a semantic classification task is that there's this engagement of lateral prefrontal cortex and suppression of the default network. However, in older adults, there's this shift in the dynamic balance. And what we can see is there's this greater recruitment of lateral prefrontal cortex, but there's this co-occurring sort of failure to deactivate the default network. So this network is not as suppressed in older adults. And interestingly, there's also changes in terms of the functional coupling between the default and executive control systems. And this was first observed by Sambataro and colleagues um, in this paper where younger and older adults um, were, conducting, were performing the NBAC task and looking at connectivity between the posterior cingulate and the rest of the brain. And what we see in younger adults is that there's greater connectivity within the default network, suggesting greater functional coherence within this system. However, older adults showed greater functional coupling between posterior cingulate and these areas involved in executive control, including lateral prefrontal cortex, which was really quite curious at the time um, and not expected. However, we saw a somewhat similar pattern in our older adults performing the autobiographical and Tower of London type tasks. So this is a replication um, of what I showed you earlier. Um, this is the task by network interaction during performance of autobiographical and visuospatial planning in young adults. This is an independent sample and a different stimuli set that was meant to draw upon shared goals between younger and older adults. Um, however, when older adults are performing these tasks, what we see is a very different pattern of functional coupling. Um, what we see actually is pretty healthy and similar performance during autobiographical planning. There's significant engagement and also um, coupling of the default network with the frontal parietal control network, um, as well as the relative uh, decoupling um, of, the, <clears throat> of the dorsal tension network. 
However, what we see during the visuospatial planning task, the Tower of London task, there's not only significant coupling of the dorsal attention network with the frontal parietal control network, but there's also significant coupling of the default network with the frontal parietal control network. Now, this isn't just that there's a higher idling rate of the default network in older adults. This is actually tracking with the task performance, such that when older adults are performing this Tower of London task, they're upregulating the default network along with the dorsal attention network um, in a significant task by network by age interaction. Now, this was something that was very curious to us, and there, there's not a lot of unpacking of what this coupling was between the default and frontal parietal control network, um, although it was nicely replicated across these two independent domains. So in collaboration with Gary Turner, we decided to really try to drill more deeply into like, the nature of these cross-network interactions and leveraging the fact that the Tower of London task actually has a built-in parametric feature such that there are three, four, five, and six move puzzles of increasing task difficulty. And um, in a series of analyses, uh, we really started to try to unpack the nature of this parametric modulation and cross-network coupling. But first, I wanted to just show the bold signal extracted from core regions of interest. So here in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, younger adults show this nice parametric increase in activity according to task difficulty. Yo older adults tend to have um, just their lateral prefrontal cortex turns on and it stays on. Now, there may be issues of neurovascular coupling underlying this. What we know is that there's not the same parametric increase in bold signal. And we see an almost mirror image of this in terms of suppression of medial prefrontal cortex. Younger adults systematically and parametrically suppress medial prefrontal cortex according to levels of difficulty, whereas there's more of a mushy response from the old. And again, this failure to deactivate. So then what we did is we took this dorsolateral prefrontal region as a seed and in a multivariate functional connectivity analysis, looked at how this region was functionally coupled across levels of difficulty and groups. And what we saw is that younger adults, when they're performing these harder levels of the planning task, have a bilateral coupling pattern such that there's contralateral recruitment from the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex during higher levels of task difficulty. Older adults showed this qualitatively different pattern, such that lateral prefrontal cortex was increasingly functionally coupled with the regions of the default network as the task became more difficult, including posterior cingulate and medial prefrontal cortex. Now, what this suggested to us, and this is extending beyond the data itself, but what we inferred is that potentially as older adults are trying to solve these problems, trying to solve this Tower of London problems, they're trying to draw upon their knowledge and their memory um, rather than working with the perceptual information in front of them. So we've called this the default executive coupling hypothesis of aging. And we think that's because by virtue of people getting older and being able to draw upon the, their knowledge of the world, this is their, their mode by which they're navigating the world. And these patterns of coupling are actually reflecting that underlying process that are regularly engaged in in older adults. So rather than relying upon the immediate perceptual information, there's a drawing upon of memory and in the context of the Tower of London, this is not an adaptive solution to solving this task. But what we think is that by virtue of this repeated pattern of drawing upon knowledge in order to solve problems, there would actually be a shifting of the underlying functional architecture of the brain as we get older. And so using resting state connectivity, we start to unpack this question in the context of aging. So in a, a study, a, a large study of younger and older adults, we first identified the default network um, using independent components analysis and looking at reductions. Um, we first saw that older adults show this functional breakdown in the covariance of the default network consistent with prior observations. But what we also see is that there's increased connectivity between the default network and lateral prefrontal cortex in older adults. So again, while there might be reductions in default network connectivity and also in suppression and task, we see that there's increased connectivity between the default and lateral prefrontal cortex in older adults. And when we associate this pattern of connectivity um, with behavior, we see that um, actually the extent to which the default network is functionally connected with lateral prefrontal cortex, it's correlated with reductions in fluid cognition. So that decline that we see with advancing age. And this is um, a nice replication of another study showing modulation of working memory performance. However, there's, as I mentioned before, there's this other trajectory of aging. It's not all characterized by decline. 
Um, there's this accumulation of knowledge about the world. And there's some interesting work showing that, that as we get older, and there are these reductions in fluid cognitive processing, that we increasingly rely upon our crystallized knowledge of the world. And that that crystallized knowledge can actually support our cognition and behavior over time. And we can see this often in the world when if you consider younger adults, um, people who are 18 years old and they're driving, you know, they're at their peak in terms of speed of processing, visual perceptual information integration with action. However, 18 year olds make terrible drivers. And that's because they don't ha yet have the knowledge and the rules of the road. It's really only when we're in middle age where there's this optimal performance. We also see this in the context of financial planning tasks or actual financial planning where middle-aged uh, and older adults are much more capable of making these more sophisticated decision-making abilities by virtue of having this accumulation of, of knowledge and experience um, over time. That it's not all about fluid cognitive reasoning. And in fact, there's this intersection where there's a combination of the two may be optimal for performance. So I've looked at this in the context of autobiographical memory and the process by which memories change over the lifespan. So what we know is that younger adults have this very rich uh, visuospatial recollective experience. And then we can score people's autobiographical memories by episodic details or these perceptual reliving uh, bits of information highlighted in green here. And there's also pieces of semantic information that are sprinkled throughout some of these younger adult recollective experiences. There's a very dramatic shift with advancing age such that the way that older adults tell the story of their life, there's far fewer episodic details and much more semantic content that's communicated. And that's really reflecting the shift towards more crystallized or semantic cognition with advancing age. And when we quantify this, the relative ratios of episodic or semantic details and relate that to the shifting neural architecture of the brain, what we see is that this amount of semantic details or these external details, the density with which older adults convey that semantic knowledge is positively correlated with the extent to which the default network is functionally coupled with lateral prefrontal cortex in advancing age. And that this is significantly different from that of younger adults. So what this suggests is that as we get older and we don't see younger adults relying upon as much the semantic knowledge, we don't see this coupling between these systems, but somewhere potentially in middle age and then as we go into older adulthood, there is this shift in the pattern of functional coupling such that older adults are drawing upon this semantic knowledge. And we see this associated with the semanticized autobiographical memory. And this is present even when controlling for declines in fluid intelligence. So we're, Gary Turner and I have tried to integrate um, some of these observations from the cognitive and neuroimaging literature. Um, and really we laid out some of our theories here and perspectives in psychological science for the default executive coupling hypothesis of aging. And with this, what our ideas are is that as we get older, um, we increasingly rely upon semantics and semantic knowledge of the world. Um, younger adults perform quite well when you're requiring cognitive control procedures but as they rely upon semantic knowledge, their performance declines, whereas older adults show this inverted pattern. And this is really based upon um, the relevance of this prior knowledge to performance. So younger adults tend to have this dynamic range of brain activity and connectivity that they can couple the default network and decouple it depending upon the demands of the environment. Whereas older adults tend to be more fixed in this coupling pattern but when, that, when there's this reliance on prior knowledge to solve ongoing problems, older adults are actually quite successful in their performance. And um, we've begun to explore these ideas in a number of domains. Um, one of them in particular is creativity in, uh, in younger and older adults. And what we see is that creativity during performance on a divergent thinking task or, or individual differences associated with, with creative thinking older adults show this greater magnitude of default executive coupling associated with their creative performance. So while overall in the broad pattern of the network architecture of the brain in young and old, there's this diffuse pattern of 
key differentiation of connectivity. So older adults just show a more connected brain, but lower functional coherence within systems, such as like reduced modularity. But we think that there's something very specific about the nature of the interactions between the frontal parietal executive control system and the default network that's um, unique in terms of leveraging this prior knowledge and bringing it to bear upon how we navigate the world and the ongoing environment. And then in some contexts, this is really quite adaptive uh, for older adults. And it's a way in which the, the accrual of life experiences are brought to bear upon how older adults navigate the world. So in conclusion, um, I'd just like to recognize um, you know, throughout these studies, what it seems to be is that the default network in fact plays this active role in cognition, that these functions can support goal-oriented behavior, and where task relevant, the default network activity can functionally couple with these executive control regions. And these executive control, uh, these default executive interactions change with advancing age, potentially signaling the shift to a more semanticized form of cognition. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for being here today. I'm really grateful to have you tune in from all of your respective locations. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, my many collaborators and um, the funding sources that allowed this work to happen. Um, and thank you very much. I'd be happy to uh, hear any of your questions. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna try, I usually try to unmute everyone for a little bit, just so that we know that there were actually over 100 people and people can clap if they'd like to. So I'm gonna unmute everyone. Hey. All right, so I, I muted everyone except for Nathan, and we will take some questions. Thank you so much for the exciting talk. It's great to be able to hear from your home in your PJs. I'm not quite wearing PJs today, but I'm sure there are some people who are doing that or staying up late, waking up early for this. So thank you very much. Um, let's see, so we had over 200 uh, registrants today. It was very exciting. We have some questions here. Nathan, is it easier if you read off of it, if you don't mind repeating in case people are calling in and can't see the screen and then answer, but I'm happy to read it also. Sure, I don't know how to see the chat. chat. Unless I, um... At the bottom, there's a chat box uh, button, but I will start reading. I'm interested in finding its association with spatial sequence, synesthesia, and precocity. Oh boy, um, those are really big conceptual sort of processes that I'm not an expert on. So it's really, I, I don't think I can actually comment on that. I think um, like aspects of synesthesia and that crossover between perceptual experiences is really um, fascinating, but I, I don't really know how that interacts with memory or the functions of the default network. But I think that'd be really fascinating to look into in more depth. Great. So how did age correlate with performance on these tasks? I think these tasks is meant by the slide that you were showing semanticized cognition and these graphs and different processes. Yeah, so as we get older, there's that increase in uh, just the, the semantic content of information. Um, and that also corresponds with like increases in vocabulary um, as we get older. And really one of our challenges is to how to really quantify and characterize um, that change in semanticization of knowledge. Um, however, overall, you know, in our older adult sample, which um, I think in that study is around 85, um, we now have over 100 that we're looking at. There is, you know, that standard decline in fluid cognitive reasoning, working memory, visuospatial processing, and whatnot. Um, but what we're trying to do is figuring out, like, okay, what are, what are the things that older adults are actually good at um, beyond just vocabulary? So looking at creative reasoning, like that was one of our first steps um, in terms of examining, like, where older adults are, can flourish um, and perform as well as younger adults. There's some interesting work coming out of Cheryl Grady's lab showing that older adults, they perform poorly on a standard measure of episodic remembering, so uh, paired associate learning. However, if you pair information that actually has, that makes semantic sense, like grocery store items with realistic prices, older adults perform as well as younger adults. But if those grocery store items have, you know, arbitrary prices tagged to it, older adults don't perform, they perform poorly 
So I think, again, it's like when you can draw upon that foundation of semantic knowledge, that's where you get that boost in, in behavior. Um, and it seems to be under that they also showed that underlying network shift um, associated with that positive performance. Great. So, um, well, great talk, comments, a fabulous talk. As you probably know, uh, this is from Sylvia Bungay, as you probably know, these networks decouple during childhood and kids with stronger coupling tend to have lower cognitive performance. Any thoughts as to why that is? Um, thanks for tuning in, Sylvia. That's great. Um, I, I mean, I think there's stage in the course of lifespan development. I absolutely, I think it's really important that there's that differentiation of function, um, that these networks need to become um, consolidated and modular in their organization um, in order to optimize that kind of functioning. And it's only through at later stages of lifespan development, um, from the 20s to 30s, where that cross-network coupling becomes more adaptive. Um, so I think if that cross-network coupling is present, you know, in kids, like it's 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 reducing the um, the efficiency of those networks um, and the specialization of the processing. So that's where I think I mean we really don't see that leveraging of prior knowledge in kids at all, um, and that's an experience. That's I think a learning ability that certainly develops. I don't know the literature super well. But just anecdotally, I know, like, even with talking to my own kids who are like 11 and nine, you know, they have a really hard time getting into the gist of things and making summaries and, and extracting that just semantic knowledge from their wealth of perceptual experiences, which they can recount in great detail, but that extraction of information and then applying it is really, really challenging. Um, and I think that's in. And I don't think that we have it very well characterized in terms of the lifespan development of um, how we use um, the, the accrual of knowledge. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there's a lot to be done there. And I'd love to continue to work more in that lifespan perspective as well, to really see that trajectory in, in terms of optimal cross-network coupling. Because certainly early on, they need to be differentiated uh, before they're reintegrated. All right. I think you're muted. I just unmute myself. I apologize. <laughs> um, so let me see. Thank you very much. Based on another question, based on Menon's tri uh, network model where salience can gate default mode network and CEN switching, are there any observed changes in Antara Insula and dorsal ACC of the salience network in aging? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's something I'm really interested in. I, there's some, again, I think the, um, the reductions in the integrity of the networks is, goes down. Um, you know, that three network model is extremely influential. And I've actually been talking with Lucina Yudin a lot about the salience network and the nature of the interactions between salience and the default network. And I think, you know, that model is, I think, somewhat limited to the extent that it really relies upon just, it's really been examined in the context of deactivating the default network. Um, not so much in terms of its active engagement during cognitive tasks. And there are very, very few studies that actually show um, recruitment of the default network um, in young, but even fewer in older age. And so really examining the nature of the salience default network interactions in the aging brain, it's, there's very few studies and it, it's, it's pretty tricky to do so. Um, so I, I'm gonna say there's some area of open inquiry, um, but I am very interested in the nature of those, those dynamics um, in particular in older age. So I've been talking a lot with Lucina about potentially like how we can go about doing that. Um, but I don't have a great answer for you yet, but I, I think it's a really important um, way to assess it. On the one hand, looking at in the context of salience default interactions in terms of modulating the default network um, with tasks that engage that system. So I think that the salience network isn't necessarily competitive or solely suppressive of the default network. I think when there's information that's in the internal environment, so in our memories, that are cued and relevant for tasks that can actually be brought online in part with salience processing. Um, but that hasn't 
there's not been a really good um, systematic investigation of that with good empirical controls, to my knowledge. There, there could be in the world, but um, I'm not familiar with it, in particular in the context of aging. But I, I think that's a great area. Uh, great. There's a couple more questions. I know a lot of people need to roll off and have already, but I just want to continue if we can, uh, if you can afford time. Can you afford a, several more minutes, Nathan? I'm here. I haven't heard my kids yell yet. Nobody's All heard. Right. I know I haven't seen them jump in in your background. I was looking forward to it, but okay, let's get to the next questions. Emotions, how frequent is hyperthymesia and what is its association with existential precocity? I, You're welcome to take a skip. I, honestly, I, I don't know what that first term is. Um, I, those are not... I. To my knowledge, um, you know, existential precocity isn't really evaluated in the empirical context. Um, I don't think we have good assessments of such a thing in cognitive neuroscience and cognition. Maybe there's some scales that could be incorporated um, to look at individual differences, but I'm not aware of them at this point. Great. Uh, sorry, I can't help out much there either. Um, next question. Emotions can influence cognitive performance. Do you think the default mode network could be involved in this? Definitely. Um, there's in the in the Yo parcellation scheme, the limbic network is dissociated from the default network. But I think in context where we have better temporal SNR, that, that those limbic regions, so anterior temporal lobes, but critically ventromedial orbital frontal cortex, and their connections to the amygdala are pretty deeply integrated with the default network. So I think that aspect of um, emotion feeds and value and reward associations um, play a pretty significant role in uh, the kinds of cognition that are modulated and operated upon by the default network. Um, I haven't done that work myself yet, um, but we're really interested in that. In particular, uh, the, the positivity bias with advancing age, where older adults um, bias their attention and their memory towards positive information, towards more affiliative relationships rather than um, younger adults who have more of a negativity bias uh, for you know, fear and aversive information processing. So that shift that occurs with age, I think is really interesting and certainly under, is there's something happening within the default network in terms of that, that biasing of positive over negative information. Um, but the, the full details I think are still need to be worked out. Great. Just two more comments slash questions. How often do you find the existence of cross-modulation in adults? Cross-modulation, I'm not sure what, um, what that means. So the, <clears throat> the flexibility of network coupling, I'll interpret it as, like how often do we see that? And again, I think it's, it depends on the kinds of studies that we're engaged in. Typically, you know, we're looking only in one domain and that's the visuospatial domain. And we see um, dorsal attention coupling with executive control regions to support like a working memory task. And that's where um, older adults are typically perform worse and you see suppression of the default network. So that's often the, the dynamic range by which we, we observe these things. It's much more rare where you open that up to more mnemonic information processing to look at the full shift between drawing up internal information or, and, or suppressing that to allocate attention to the visuospatial environment. Um, I think where the full range is presented, you know, we, we do see the, those dynamics fairly reliably, um, depending on how it's constrained by the task itself. Great. One final question or comment. We are in the midst of writing up a study that shows salience network linked upregulation of default mode network during autobiographical memory re recall, albeit in healthy young adults. Would, would definitely be interesting to look at this in the older population. Thank you again. This is from Sarab Shah. All right. Well, that sounds awesome. Please, you know, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, if you want to send me an email, I'd be really curious to see um, how that unfolds. I think that's, that's great. I think that's just the sort of thing that really, like, is valuable to look at is that salience default interactions in these other contexts. Because um, I think that's a real key to understanding how the dynamic range um, is modulated um, in the brain. Well, thank you very much again. And Nathan, if you can stay online, just I want to chat with you just a little bit before you roll off. But thank you very much. We're going to end this seminar series. We'll see you next time in two weeks, same time with Danny Bassett. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye.
can we, I'm gonna end this for now.